Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll just give it a minute or so for everyone to fill in. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. We've got a great group of panelists. Just some quick housekeeping up top before we begin. Uh, we are recording today's session. So if you would like to watch the replay, just reach out and we will make sure it is available to you. We will also be making time for Q&A towards the end of this call. So you can start leaving your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. All right, Craig, over to you. Sure, please, over to me. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Patterson. I'll be your host for the event the, this afternoon. Uh, you'll see we have a, a, a range of experts with us, uh, four, four from Marsh across various aspects of our business, and one uh, guest from OQ in Oman, Mohammed Al Hinai. So uh, thank you for our guests for attending this, uh, and we look forward to this session and hope that you find it of interest to you. Next slide, please. So key things to remember, and as you've been advised, uh, first of all, we will be doing question and answers. So please, if you have any questions or anything you would like to ask or learn about, then just use uh, the free form and click submit, and we'll take that question. And given and depending upon the time at the end of the session, we will try to answer all the questions. And if we can't answer for you at the session, we'll be more than happy to send you an answer uh, as soon as we possibly can. Okay, next slide, please. So just to do a quick recap on, on where we are, uh, Marsh obviously takes the current situation very seriously. Uh, and we understand that many of our clients, including yourselves, across various different industries, are all at different points in this current situation that we have. And obviously, we've been holding a series of sessions over the last, what is effectively now, six months. And we will continue to do so because we believe it's important that any knowledge, experience, and capabilities that we have is important to be shared with you, our trusted and valued clients. So this will not be the last one, and it's certainly not, as many of you are aware, the first session that we've done. But we thank you for attending them as well. So just as a quick news roundup, and, and obviously this quickly goes out of date, and, and I think what's key in looking at some of the issues that are raised here is how it does differ both across countries and across regions. So we put up some news regarding different countries in each of the regions, and as you can see, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a variance, a considerable variance from schools reopening in Oman to an alarming rise in Bahrain. So every day the situation is changing and it's changing rapidly. Uh, if you listen to the television, whether we're in first phase, second phase, third phase, no one actually knows it's too early. What I think is most interesting, and there was an article in the newspaper here in Dubai yesterday, that, that uh, here in UAE, they're, they're talking about a potential vaccine for frontline workers. Interestingly enough, if you watch the international television, it didn't make it on to that news. So it'll be interesting to see where this is all going forward. Obviously, with uh, President Trump in the US, he wants a vaccine before the election. Uh, and Dr. Fauci and all the medical experts are saying that's highly unlikely. I think what personally what is key in all this is the situation that we're in is going to continue to fluctuate. And it certainly won't die down in any way until we have some sort of of vaccine in place. Okay, next slide, please. Putting that into context, I mean, we've built numerous models, and this one's different from the ones that we started with uh, not that long ago, uh, where we talked about uh, respond, recover, rebound, reimagine, and reinvent yourself. I think what we're beginning to realize now is this middle phase, this second phase, is much, much longer than is actually anticipated. If you just said to me six months ago that we would be still in the height of what I believe personally is, is phase one or wave one, I probably wouldn't have believed you at the time. And you can see even within this, we're now seeing, and, and I remember doing a presentation with Raj a while back, we were talking about three to six months or so six to 12 months. You can see we're now looking at beyond one year before we really see there being a huge amount of recovery. Uh, I remember earlier on in the month, uh, someone senior uh, within the government here in, in, in UAE saying that for the hotel sector, it's probably not until 2022 
before there's a real form of recovery. So whilst we have this gradual opening, whilst we have this kind of working from home, moving to a hybrid home, not home for a lot of office people, while you can go out and uh, eat in restaurants in certain countries, you still have issues like, like we all have, for example, with schools. It only takes a small number of teachers to come down with COVID and then the schools close. So we're going through this up and down, up and down. The only good point we believe is that that ups will slowly reduce uh, and they'll become lesser and lesser before we move into some form of recovery. Now, I'm not going to speculate, and when we use the phrase the new norm, I actually believe I don't know what the new norm really is now, but in a specific norm at the moment, what that new norm is going to be is still really, in my view, to emerge, and we'll find out as we go through this what has been said is probably the biggest event of most of our lives, what's going on at the present moment. So if we go on to the next slide, please. And I'll pass over to my colleague Assad to, to talk through this. Yeah, thanks, Craig. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I guess, you know, in, in line with what Craig was mentioning about the uh, pandemic cycle and basically um, uh, how it's going to transition into different phases, the insurance market in MENA had also had gone into tremendous uh, changes as well. So uh, we've tried to basically capture for you like how did half one look like and what did we uh, expect or what do we expect actually the half two to look like as well. But looking at the uh, key trends uh, that already happened. So, um, you know, we've gone through the pandemic issue. Uh, the status itself had been uh, kind of a lockdown, um, business was, had gone into recession, um, economies had slowed down and it had impacted uh, kind of the entire industries. All the industries across different countries have been impacted by um, uh, the, the pandemic situation. Uh, this had also resulted an issue when it comes to cash flows. And uh, I believe we've got so many examples uh, that have happened in the market, not even regionally, but globally as well around uh, companies, for example, filing for uh, bankruptcy, bankruptcy chapters, uh, going out of business, changing even the business model as well. So a lot of examples that have happened in, uh, during the past couple of months. Um, turning more of a focus or attention towards the insurance industry itself, uh, we've kind of split it between the property and casualty, which is the PNC, and the EHMB, which is the employee health and benefits. On the property and casualty, um, the treaty terms um, kind of which had been renewed on 1st of Jan uh, started to carry uh, kind of more exclusions on the communicable disease, which is mainly uh, COVID-19 in this case. And we've seen more and more policies that have been introduced with such exclusions midterm during the policy period uh, where it was imposed by the reinsurance market. Um, we've also seen a change in appetite. So reinsurance uh, markets have uh, uh, kind of ceased to write sizable business, for example, in the uh, middle. Uh, so the, the attention was changed or has moved into co-insurance solutions where we get more, uh, I would say, local markets to participate on a single, uh, on a single risk. So um, that basically caused a change in the way that uh, insurers started writing business, which meant that we had to look into more insurers to uh, participate because they've been taking lesser or lower sizes of shares that, than what three insurers used to take in the past. Uh, however, despite that, um, we still feel that there is still some good uh, appetite for smaller risks where uh, it falls within the local underwriter capabilities that's where the competition is happening at the moment. So that, that's where reinsurance or uh, support is not required from uh, beyond the, the local insurer uh, requirements. Um, on, the, on the employee health and benefits side, which is mainly medical and life, uh, we've seen regulatory changes well related to COVID-19 coverage. Uh, majority of the countries in MENA, for example, have started uh, enforcing, uh, let's say, local regulations to allow insurance, medical insurance policy to, ca to carry uh, COVID-19 costs. And that's in, in respect of uh, medical claims. 
So uh, any admission, um, any kind of uh, symptoms which are considered as severe where it requires ICU, for example, treatment or hospitalization has been picked up by medical insurance policies. Um, we, we also in, we've also seen um, as well insurers looking, uh, pressurizing more towards uh, basically achieving better profitability or better margins. And that is by uh, retaining more business and even citing new business as well. Um, the, the, sta the, the stability of the, uh, of the book uh, has been led mainly by, uh, let's say, increase uh, in premiums, which has resulted or have started, to be honest, a bit earlier than, uh, I would say, the pandemic crisis. But the pandemic has added to it where uh, increases have become more visible in the uh, on the on the let's say on the short term. Um, in, in addition to that, the cash flow issue when it came to uh, payment requirements that have been imposed by regulators or insurers to pay claims immediately to carriers has also imposed a lot of cash flow pressure on the insurers and therefore uh, more tighter requirements around uh, let's say premium payments. Uh, we've also seen some movement on the reinsurance side, which we haven't seen in the past, where uh, several leading reinsurers uh, on the employee health and benefits on the medical side that have started uh, changing their underwriting strategy and pulled out from the market recently within the MENI region. So basically, it has created a limitation in competition, again, that added more into the hard market and the price increases that we've seen in the market. Now, looking at this um, uh, side of the story, which is what happened in, in 2020, we're looking at now ahead, what would happen next? Now, we've seen positive vibes with uh, the ease of lockdown. And uh, I believe uh, studies are showing that it might, I mean, Q4 touch wood, that it might look as better than what had been already forecasted in the past. So. Uh, it, might, it might show even signs of a positive improvement on uh, economy. However, in line with what Craig was saying earlier, that we're, we're going to see the kind of the, the curve going up and down, uh, this might also lead to certain restrictions that can be imposed uh, on the economy itself. We're looking at, for example, Jordan recently, they've just locked down the, uh, let's say, uh, food and beverage industry for two weeks. So uh, again, there could be some changes that might be imposed. However, uh, we see more mergers and acquisitions happening and uh, on the insurance side, uh, we've seen that in Saudi and in the UAE recently that have, uh, that have occurred. Um, change management and strategy for carriers, there's gonna be a certain focus or better focus, for example, on driving the appetite towards a certain line of business in respect of even certain industries, uh, we've seen a change, as I said earlier, in um, the, the business activity that certain clients were used to basically uh, operate. Um, I'll give just some examples. I mean, looking at Kareem or Uber, for example, they've started actually delivering kind of materials rather than uh, honestly just people. So it's, it's kind of a change in trying to find alternative or ways of uh, source of incomes. Um, Looking again on the insurance side, property and casualty, uh, I think more restrictions will happen on, on deployment of capacity by local insurers. Uh, we foresee that um, it will be with an increase on price. However, um, it might be controlled with uh, more dependency on co-insurance, uh, at least on the short term, but we need to keep an eye on the July, or let's say renewals that have happened on the reinsurance side with the insurers where uh, there might have been some exclusions that had been inserted. We have not felt that yet, but we're keeping an eye on that. Um, classification of carriers and certain risks, that's impactful. So for example, uh, certain carriers have decided not to write a specific type of business and that basically leads to uh, more dependency on the reinsurance market, as I said earlier, which again, um, kind of impacts pricing. Um, insurers are also becoming more demandful. So uh, as, they're, as they're looking at their, their uh, not the top line, but they're looking at the bottom line to make more money, they're looking at underwriting information and basically imposing certain requirements that allows uh, to pass more, I would say, responsibility towards the client where he retains more through deductible format, for example, 
rather than uh, passing on the risk to the insurer. So um, it's a, it's a two-way direction in, uh, or discussion in this case. On the employee health and benefits, uh, I think the pricing will continue to be under pressure. Um, with, uh, I mean, with the economy slowdown, um, it's going to put pressure on, mar- on, the, on the insurers to basically sustain their books. However, um, still we can foresee some competition moving forward when it comes to uh, applying new business. So I think insurers will end up basically competing a lot to basically win some business. Um, the, the problem that we will, con- we will start seeing in the future is I believe the COVID-19 cases um, that, will pro- that has not been forecasted in claims earlier. So this is, um, we've seen that the average cost is around $13,000 depending on the type of treatment, but this, this 13,000 is mainly related to the severe cases, uh, which I think it will become part of the insurer's consideration when they conduct pricing, and it will be part of the loading that goes into the premiums that are being calculated. Um, in addition to that, those governments that had um, uh, enforced laws on insurers to pay claims on COVID-19 might take off such uh, enforcement. We've seen that in some countries in, in the region where uh, part of some areas had, um, had kind of lifted off the requirement and insurers started to basically trigger the exclusions that are kind of considered standard under medical insurance. Um, last but not least, basically the reinsurance market is now kind of imposing more strict measures. Um, they're basically trying to impose uh, better underwriting skills and therefore alternative uh, ways of pricing are going to be imposed uh, when it comes to the carriers, which we believe can be tackled by, again, more competition with the market to allow, uh, uh, to allow cater for such a, a, an action. Uh, with that, I believe, um, I think this is uh, my slide. I would hand back over to Greg to continue the presentation next slide. Okay, thank you very much for that in-depth analysis of the state of the current insurance market. Obviously, for everyone on the call, that is into the second half of the year and we're already in to September. There may be a number of you who have long-term agreements who might be thinking that, you know, if I have to wait another 12 months until my renewal, there's a chance that the market may have changed back to what it was before. I think it's safe to say that you can't really make that assertion at the moment. And even similar to the way the pandemic is going, it is likely the insurance market will continue to be very volatile at the moment, which segues us into beginning to understand two things that are important in relation to risk uh, within the the, the pandemic environment uh, that we're in. Uh, The first one really is beginning to understand that for many people on, on the call, this was a risk that may have been on your risk registers, but it it was never perceived as as one of your major potential uh, issues to consider. Uh, And that's not because you weren't particularly interested in it as a risk. It was probably there were more important things in the short term that needed to be addressed. Additionally, and Marsh does a lot of work with the World Economic Forum to produce the, the risk report every year. Even there, pandemics had kind of slowly started to fall down the, uh, the ladder, as they say, and, and wasn't really in the top tier of risks to be considered. And, and that's really what the new issue around risk is all about now, this idea of what is the next, what we would call a black swan, something we hadn't thought about, or a grey swan, that is something we have thought about, but it's actually much bigger than we realise. And then that's what the diagram here looks to, looks to bring forward things that need to be considered uh, they're very geopolitical, they're very large, they're, they're very kind of major issues, but I think what the pandemic has taught us, probably more than anything else, is that when most people thought of risk, they probably thought, you know, a fire or an explosion, or a change to a market, or it could be, uh, uh, you know, the inability to replace key staff. But these types of risk, while incredibly important, tend to be very location or geographical specific. What the pandemic has taught us is that it it, it knows no geographical bounds and and therefore it becomes a very different idea and very different risk than we originally understood. So you can see up here 
that starting to move into the more kind of larger strategic like area of looking for what are the emerging issues now some of these emerging issues take trade and tariff law for example it's it's very generic but in relation to your organization it may actually spin off into a smaller concept that is actually very important to you how does that impact upon your business we know for example the current u.s president president trump is, is very good at making snap decisions. There's no awareness. There could be a, a, a tariff war uh, with your country next week, for all we know. You, you've got to prepare for these. Or, or very few people would have, would have no, never mind guessed or believed, but realized that in the background there was a, a treaty discussion going on between Israel, the UAE, uh, supported by the US. So a lot of things of these emerging risks are not necessarily so easy to see and how they shape out and impact you is an issue. If we go on to the next slide, please. So what we're beginning to see from clients and we're hearing from people is, well, how do I deal with these issues? I mean, a lot of CEOs and boards that we've spoken to have been saying, okay, we know pandemics is now an issue. What's the next one I need to be aware of? And then similar to where we're getting with Raj and, and Ersin talking about it is, what is the evaluation of it? What is the potential financial exposure to me? Because uh, that is really what this is all about. I mean, everyone can say, yes, we had pandemics on our, on our risk list and it was number 12, but no one really had probably put a number anywhere near the size of the financial cost. So you've had all your operational costs, your, your fixed costs that you couldn't get out of. Okay, you've had reductions like we have had in marsh and variable costs, but then you've got all your revenue losses, you've got all your disruptions you have to deal with, all the additional spend to, to change your operating environment that, that's coming straight out of your budgets, your capex, your opex, and your bottom, bottom lines. So the important thing is to look at the, these risks now and say, from a financial perspective, what is the worst case scenario and, and how much could I potentially lose here or from a financial perspective. And then setting out what we call your kind of appetite for these kind of risks. I mean, how much of this risk am I willing to absorb on my own balance sheet? And how much do I have to find a way of either reducing it or transferring it to another party where appropriate? And obviously bringing these larger risks into the whole strategic decision making process because Whereas for many people with risk registers, and we see this with a lot of our clients, is that there, there can sometimes be a disconnect between risk identification and assessment and what it means to the business. Now we're beginning to see that a major risk like pandemics is a board, it is a C-suite related risk, and it does have a huge impact on what your strategy is going forward. Many people have you know, basically torn up the strategy for the year and moved into what is our go forward, our rebound, our recover strategy, which is for many very different. So understanding it financially is very important. So if we go to the next slide, please. So as I was saying, you've really got to start looking at different types of these emerging, emerging risks. So the, if we take the shock events, uh, that, that's kind of one of the three key areas that, that, that can, can affect you as an operation. So it's, it comes out the blue. This is exactly what the pandemic was. You could argue it was primarily a shock event. Uh, I mean, no one had any pre-preparation for it. You could argue it was possibly known in November 2019, uh, but the information wasn't necessarily available. There was no ramp up period. There was no, how can I put it? Uh, it's not like a tsunami. It's not like a a typhoon or a tropical cyclone where you tend to get a wrap up, ramp up period, sorry. So it was very much a shock event. The other ones are the emerging threats. So these are ones that you know about, but are they changing? So the geopolitical situation, for example, here in, in, in the Middle East, uh, the changes to your operations, you can see the potential impacts to your business, then you can start to look at them and understand what you can do about them uh, and risks which may be lower currently in your risk register that you might want to look at and say, you know what, with our changing environment and changing operations and changes to who we are as a company, 
these risks are actually a lot bigger or potentially bigger than they were before. And it may even be that, and most people tend to have the top 10 risks, that a number of these risks in the top 10 may drop down a layer and be fundamentally replaced. And then you've got what we call the systemic risks. These are where your current operations, things that you actually do, your networks, your uh, IT systems, your physical operations, your uh, equipment, et cetera. So these are systemic risks within the business. You, you could be taking a not so positive view on those and therefore how can you ensure that the systemic side of these risks that they will eventually become something that is emerging, how do you limit it now? So really there are three key areas when you're looking at what these risks are and it's all about understanding you know, how much could they potentially cost on the bottom line, whether it's related to your financial capability uh, and whether that's your cash flow, uh, whether it's affecting your EBITDA, even whether it's a revenue generating issue and then your appetite, how much risk are you willing to take? So if you go on to the next slide, please. Now, it's very easy for me to sit here today and say all of that. And, and, and I've spoken before on this a number of years ago, is that it is difficult to know and to understand uh, where you sit and what information is available. I think what's key to that is this idea of, if you'd have asked this question 15 years ago, there was virtually no information available. The problem for many in risk managers and insurance managers is with the internet, uh, and with the advance in the concept of thought leadership and, and the move towards the use of what many, not just insurance brokers, but also uh, accountancy firms and consultants call effectively knowledge transfer, there is a wash with information available to you. And the issue then is, how do you see the real answers from all the data and information that's available to you. We've got it down here is how do you separate the noise uh, away from what are the issues you have to address? And, and that's a, a technically a very difficult thing to do uh, in today's world. I mean, where we see the opportunity for that is taking a data centric view. So looking at it analytically and trying to determine really what are the numbers saying to you? Uh, and what do these numbers mean in relation to your business? Uh, additionally, with all the information that's out there, it can be very confusing because it gives mixed messages. If I was to give you 10 reports from 10 different companies in relation to the future of the Internet of Things, you would get many different responses. So it's really about being able to take the data that's available and take a very, very prescriptive and, and analytical view of how you can look at that to get value from it. So if we go on to the next slide, please. So just putting that into sort of kind of one final bundle it all up. Uh, we at Marsh have been, uh, as we would say, we've, we've been struggling with this issue as much as everyone else. Uh, we've been talking to many of our clients and we're trying to address this black and gray swans issue. We've put up here a, a series of activities we think you need to do uh, that companies should be looking to do to try and address how to identify these issues, understand how financially big they are, how they would impact on your existing strategy and strategies you would have to make to change your operations, to deal with them, and basically what is the best way forward to deal with them now, that is stress testing your risk mitigations to optimize your position so that when these black and gray swans arrive, because I, I, I to give you an example, we, we, we the WHO, there's no such thing as no pandemic. Their, their, their four-point guide is uh, interpandemic. So when there is no plan, when there is no pandemic, they call it interpandemic. It's the green box. And what they're basically saying is it's the space between the next one. And that's the space we're moving into at the moment. We're looking at we're in the space between a pandemic and what's the next black and gray swan. And what can you do about it to make sure that you're prepared for the potential next one. So if we go to the next slide, please. We're gonna do some polling. Uh, Arjun, can I leave you to organize the polling, please? So you'll see here, there is a question. If you would just like to choose which of the following you are most concerned about.
Craig, do you want to talk about which risks well, you think are more? Say the good, yeah, the good thing about the polling is we can see how many people are here, and, and the, we're already halfway through, or almost halfway through the number of people polling at the moment, which is good. It's good to see what they're thinking. I think what's interesting is coming up is nothing particularly is, is, is standing out as the major issue to be considered. And, and that's an important point in its own right, which I'll come on to if that is what the final answer is. So I'll just give it one more minute. And then from after that minute's over, I'll give an overview of, of my take on what this poll means. Okay, well, I think, forget about the one minute, I think we'll just move on. Uh, I think you will see here uh, with the results that we have, that there is virtually no single standout issue. The largest one being the financial system breakdown at 23%. At now, people might say this isn't a result because it, it's a scatter diagram, right? But it is actually a very important result. It shows the number of emerging risks that people are concerned about. There's, there's only, out of all of them, really the only ones were really fiscal crisis and trade and tariff war, which didn't score very highly. But for the rest of them, it's a real mixed bag. So what we're seeing here is that people are looking at this and thinking, I'm not actually sure which one is going to be next. Uh, there's no particular underlying drivers at the moment that say one over the other. Uh, and that's an important issue that has to be addressed from a risk perspective. Uh, it now shows that you don't just look at your risk register and pick the biggest one. There's a whole range of risks that have to be considered, which may not even be deemed to be in your top 10. So that's great. Thank you very much for the polling. Uh, do you want to stop sharing the results, Arjun, and we can move on? So, oh. Great. I don't know how to get it away, Arjun. I, I, here you go. Great. Okay, so I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Erson, who's going to talk about the financial side of this decision-making process. Thanks, Craig. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Erson Dektaş, leading analytics practice for MENA and Turkey. As part of Marsh Consulting Solutions, uh, we are helping companies to dynamically explore risk financing options and determine their optimal risk financing structures and risk mitigation investments. For the last 10 years, Marsh is uh, investing on its data capabilities and analytics solutions. Our team has been collecting placement and claims data from different regions and built databases and developed market leading analytic and modeling tools just to analyze better our clients' potential losses and optimize their risk transfer strategies. So as uh, Craig mentioned, uh, understanding emerging risk and uh, determining the risk mitigation strategies is something we need to be prepared as an organization. We are experiencing unprecedented times due to COVID-19. And in last six months, uh, we observed that its impact is not equal between industries or countries in MENA. Moreover, uh, there has been a radical reshaping of the risk environment. All the businesses have, uh, ex have experienced a change in their risk profile due to a number of reasons like operational challenges, new consumer requirements, supply chain disruptions, and as a consequence, their uh, liquidity has been impacted uh, by the prolonged recession of the global economy and also due to surge in bankruptcies in uh, certain industries or sectors. These changes impact our clients' risk profile and their liquidity position, and therefore their cost of risk and the need for the cash and equivalents. Understanding risk is and how to potentially reduce the costs related to your risk management activities is important to everyone. Therefore, uh, we believe as a starting point, total cost of risk is a good way to measure the effectiveness of risk management programs. Most of the time, our client's main concern is uh, the, the premium expenditures. However, it is only uh, one side of the medal. 
making an informed decision on your risk and insurance management activities actually requires a full picture of all the related costs. And when we are talking about the total cost for managing risk and insurance, uh, we also need to take into account the costs uh, related to risk transfer, uh, risk controls, which might include the uh, internal trainings, ERM and business continuity plannings, and the risk retentions cost, uh, the losses below your deductibles, your claim handling costs, and et cetera. Next slide, please. Thanks. So reduce, reducing these costs is a process and this is how it looks like. I, be, I believe uh, some of you might already be familiar with the whole process. A key to the success of the risk risk management starts uh, with the understanding key financial indicators of your company and setting the definitions for stakeholders expectation on acceptable level of risk and understand the risk limits at the business unit level. Once we set the risk tolerance levels, it'd be good to focus on the allocation key to the insurable risks and non-insurable risk. For example, 20% of uh, it, it could be allocated to property risk in the company and the rest could be allocated to other type of insurable or non-insurable risks. And once the risk appetite and tolerance levels are set, uh, identifying companies critical and emerging risk is a key to determining the future impact on companies financial. Craig has already given you insight uh, regarding this step. And what I can add here is uh, based on our experience, the process could be only effective, it is dynamic. So the risk self-assessments needs to be conducted uh, on a continuous basis due to current risk environment. And moreover, moreover, it's more effective when it's proactive, structured, including templates and potentially supported by the system support. And as can be seen on the third step, uh, we need to assess the severity and the likelihood of the risks. And rather than using a qualitative uh, likelihood and impact analysis, quantifying the risk based on the internal data, uh, benchmark data and external data is adding more value to companies' risk management activities. And what is crucial here is to understand each and every cost element is a actual key to proper risk quantification exercise. This eventually allows companies to prioritize their critical risk on and understand the impact on their KPIs and uh, eventually enables a more effective conversation with the board. And when talking regarding the insurable and non-insurable risks, finding, finding the right balance between risk transfer and the risk retention is important to any business. Challenging uh, your current risk and insurance management strategy will help you to reduce the costs and free capital. And as a consequence, consequence it supports the business for both short-term tactical requirements and long-term strategic plans. Uh, as an example, uh, let's assume uh, the company has an FX risk. And if you're able to hedge your FX or commodity risk on a regular basis and have created a optimum portfolio uh, in the company, your main concern won't be the volatility of them anymore. And for your insurable risk like asset integrity or, pro or your property risk insurance program, it might be good to compare your program with your peers or one step further analyzing the impact of increasing the deductible or lowering the limit if there is a room uh, will allow you to see if, if you are transferring the risk with the right strategy in the company. And another main concern is actually uh, in these days uh, is the bad debt risk. So uh, your main concern might be transferring bad debt or credit risk of the company. And uh, typically, Accounts receivable rep represents approximately 35 to 40% of a company's assets. Therefore, um, having an optimized rate credit insurance can help uh, your company to protect these assets from 
the losses caused by the insolvency and also help you improve your liquidity positions on your uh, financials. And um, even we uh, manage our risks and uh, we cannot fully actually transfer some of the risk uh, to the market. And that's why we have our internal controls in place. Uh, having a pre-loss mitigations or actions will reduce the likelihood and the severity, risk, uh, severity of the risk and uh, helps you to minimize the retained costs on your balance sheet. Uh, and thanks to these controls, uh, there will be a decrease in the number of claims, which means uh, you will be having less additional claims and collateral costs, which again, uh, enable companies to better manage their cash flows. So these six steps, uh, we believe applying this process will allow you to have an optimized risk management strategy. And on the next slides, uh, you can see our uh, insurable risk uh, approach. And when we analyze insurable risk, our approach is actually very similar to what you have seen in the previous slide. We believe uh, that our clients cover and cost uh, of the risk needs to be reviewed and there and uh, your risk profile has changed uh, due to COVID-19. And uh, this pro your programs needs to be right size and to reflect the new environment. Therefore, uh, understanding your overall cost of risk and the program that minimize and the minimize that program is very important to everyone. everyone. The process is actually starts with the question, what is the amount of risk you are willing to take? and what is your risk, risk appetite. Once we understand your company's risk levels for the risk in scope, we then start analyzing your historical claims just to better understand your past experience and combining this information with our benchmark data. And if there's also, uh, you already developed the worst case scenario and uh, using this, all of, all, of, all of this information we run simulations and we quantify your risk and uh, this allows us to see the total risk exposure of the company. Uh, thanks to this exercise your ex organization uh, understand the average risk you retain on your financial financials or and also uh, you can also see the exposure in a bad year. In order to answer what is the cost efficient program uh, that you need to purchase uh, for your organization, we evaluate a couple of insurance program options, uh, including uh, different limits, deductibles, uh, which is aligned with your current risk appetite levels. And in order to assess the cost, we conduct a economic cost of risk analysis, which is including the retained losses below deductible, uh, the losses excess the limit, your premium, the taxes, and lastly, the implied risk charge, which is known as the opportunity cost of financing these unexpected losses. Okay. Yeah. Thanks Essence, to- shall, uh, we, shall, we leave, shall we leave this one here? Because we're, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time that is left and we'd like to introduce uh, our, uh, okay. our esteemed Okay, okay. Now I'm, I'm handing over to Rush, who's going to discuss the recent project that Marsh has executed sure. on queue. Rush. Raj, are you on mute? Raj? Raj, we cannot hear you. We can't hear you, Raj, you're on mute. Apologies, the, the, the common phrase of 2020, um, you're on mute. Um, so, so let me start again. Um, so to kick this session off, um, I've invited Mohamed al Hanai, who is the, the Group Insurance Director for Oman Q, to discuss his recent experience with working with Marsh to better understand the risks Oman Q face. So, so firstly, welcome Mohamed. Thank you very much for your time today. 
I thank you, Raj, uh, for inviting me. And it's uh, it's going to be interesting to discuss this topic because uh, we just uh, saw the results of it recently. Perfect, perfect. So, so Mohammed, then maybe we can kick off and um, uh, perhaps you want to elaborate your position with Omar, uh, Omar and Cube, but also maybe give us some background as to the situation you faced during your last renewal. So uh, first of all, uh, my name is Mohamed Hinai and I lead the OQ uh, program uh, uh, with regards to all insurance policies, including uh, projects, uh, operations, marine, and uh, even the uh, local uh, lines. And we, have, we, we manage insurance for a man-based asset, but also we have assets in Germany, US, and China. Uh, so what happened last year, we were, uh, OQ is, uh, has been uh, established by the integration of nine entities. Uh, or, uh, nine entities, and the main entities were Oman Oil, uh, ex Oman Oil, and ex Orpic. So to do that, uh, so one, one, one of the things we did was also consolidating the full insurance program. We used to have separate insurance programs for each entity uh, with different limits, with different deductibles, waiting periods, and also different policy wordings. And so the exercise we did last year was, okay, can we bring every, everything into one policy uh, for, for uh, international and, and local sections? Uh, uh, one waiting period, one deductible, and uh, and uh, one limit, rather than buying different uh, limits. So we thought at that time when markets started to go up, we thought by the, doing this we will really get a good a good uh, favorable market rates. However, uh, due to the increase in markets, the price we had to pay was even higher than what individually these asset paid. But if we kept the program as is every company goes separately, would have even paid uh, uh, more than that, like big, big amount. Uh, so we did the consolidation. It was it resulted in a good way, avoiding a higher, higher cost. And we went to the management. The management was happy with the result, but at the same time, they challenged us. And they told us, well, listen, how can we make sure that we don't face the same situation next year? What can you guys do? And this is where we engaged with Marsh and tried to find solution in terms of what could we do in terms to manage this program more actively. We don't want just to go to the market at the end of the year and then get do the renewal. We want to understand this program much better from, from, from a retention perspective, from risk management perspective, and then we uh, get the best optimized structure for us. And, and Mohammed, had your senior management considered your, your cost of risk or your, or your risk appetite before? No, so that, that's interesting. So it's not. So the way we used to do it in the past is we had that deductible, which was set, I don't know, long time ago, driven by basically what the, pro the lenders wanted to have, a minimum deductible, because we had projects for our, that are uh, refinanced with the, with, the, with, the, with the clauses that we have to meet. The same waiting period have been there for the last six, seven years. So we wanted to understand now with this consolidation, uh, uh, how can we do things differently? Are we as a group like OQ is a big group? Is one million deductible, is it really sufficient for us? Maybe we should take higher risk and see how that can uh, help us uh, get the best uh, optimized, uh, let's say, uh, structure for us. So it was not, so this is something new. Yeah. Um, perfect, um, and maybe uh, Mohammed, if, if I could ask, you know, how did working with um, the Marsh team, in, in particular the analytics part, um, help with your with your 2020 renewal strategy? Yeah. So what we so since we had we started discussion with you, Raj, and your team, we first wanted to understand, okay, what would be uh, the best retention structure for OQ going forward, given our loss history, given our uh, risk engineering data given our uh, business interruption scenarios, what would be uh, the, the, the results? So, uh, so first of all, before starting all this activity, uh, so we, uh, uh, using your services, we were, be, we were able to discuss, we were able to see the different retention programs in terms of waiting period and deductible, what would be the uh, one in 50 years event, one in 20 years event, one in uh, 10 years event in terms of impact. And based on that, we got results, and then we presented that to the management and tell them what would make you, what what kind of event will make you sweat, start worrying, 
And this is where we touch the risk appetite part and we said, fine, up to X amount, we are able to take that risk. And from there, we agreed uh, the, the, the confidence level, which was uh, 98%, if I'm not mistaken. And then the 150 years event uh, impact and 60 days uh, and different deductible scenarios, 5, 10, 15, 25. Uh, so once we did that, then we, we told Marsh, let's now go to the market and let's see what will be the best uh, uh, optimal structure for us. Uh, no, perfect. And um, uh, thank you so much for elaborating, Mohamed. I, I know we're close to your, your placement, so um, you know, we, we will continue to work to getting that across the line for you. Um, thanks again for your time today. Um, what I propose now um, is we, we open up the, the floor for um, some further Q&A. Um, Arjun, um, are there any questions coming in through the, through the submission box? Nothing as of yet, Raj, but something I wanted to ask Craig in particular, just to get the ball rolling, is that in reference to those emerging risks you talked about earlier, you mentioned the fact that obviously no one could foresee that a pandemic outbreak would be something that we will be talking about in 2025 years ago. So do you think something like climate change has the potential to be that, in, I mean, obviously people are talking about it in the sense that it's unavoidable, it crosses all boundaries. Could that be the next big risk that we're all looking at? Okay, so that, thank you for that, that's a great question. I think climate change is a difficult one because it is so, so much bigger there are so many components of it with a pandemic you know it's a virus and it affects people even using the concept of terrorism there are many different components uh, within terrorism i think that the problem we have with climate change uh, globally is that people can can't bring it down to a small kind of piece that they understand uh, it's so large and it's so big so i would always recommend clients to to look at how do you break that down? Is it weather related? What are the key things that you need to consider? Uh, and then you can build it up in the background about climate change. But I, I do worry it's, 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 it's such a large elephant that people, that, that's what causes people not to really grasp the problem. Okay. Are there any more questions? I think if I check the, the site, there are a number of coming up. Uh, one here we've got, is emerging risk, uh, can it be considered as a risk domain, a classification, or a type? Very difficult question. Uh, there are two ways of looking at it. Well, the first way is exactly as you say, have it as a type of risk, so have it as a category, uh, which would then be emerging risks. The problem with that is that once you've categorized it, and put it into a category, it's no longer emerging because you know about it. So that's the problem you have with that. I would say it's more identifying risks which you add to a risk register, which currently are not there or are currently not seen as being risks and say, these are emerging, do you believe they are emerging and, and putting in methodologies, looking at enhancement of risk, interdependency of risk to identify whether it is or is not emerging. Uh, I don't see any other questions at the moment. Arjun, is there any other questions you would like the panel to review? Uh, I think we're just out about time, Craig, unfortunately. Sure. Okay. Well, look, once again, uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. We always like to uh, give out our thought leadership to our clients uh, and particularly thank you uh, to our client at OQ. Mohammed, thank you very much for your time and, and joining today. And thank you to my fellow panelists for attending. Uh, there will be further sessions. We will keep you informed. If you have any questions, once you go away and uh, think about what's been said, or if you view the recording again, then please let any of the four names up here know, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. So as I always say at the end of these sessions, Thank you for attending and remember, stay safe. All right, goodbye. Bye.